All right. Well, I guess today was just one of those days. I, fuck, man, I was just so tired. So I went to bed. I took a nap. Um, <coughs> and then got some coffee. I forgot. I've, I've been drinking a lot more coffee than I'm used to. And I think I was having a caffeine withdrawal this morning. So I'm going to have to tone that down a little bit. Um, but I think because I just don't drink soda anymore, it's usually the soda I drink is caffeinated. I think that changed a lot of things. That's probably, oh man, that's probably why I've been so tired lately. Cause it's only been a few weeks. Um, I've only, I've had a couple sodas in the last couple of weeks, but it's cause it's been so inconsistent with my schedule that, um, it just makes sense that years of that will finally come into withdrawal and then going back into it. I had 400 milligrams of caffeine yesterday. That's like four cups of coffee. So, so today I'm down to 200. So tomorrow I'll do 100 and I'll stick with that for a couple days just so that way I can be consistent with my days. And then um, I'll try to cut it back again. I'll try to find another source of caffeine, maybe less, no coffee, caffeine. Maybe I could do like pills or something. Just for a little bit, I can just crack them open, have like a quarter at a time or something. But um, yeah, I'm a lot more sensitive to caffeine, I think. So, but so I've decided I'm going to read a little bit of this. I'm gonna do uh, and then do a little workout like I did yes yesterday. I think I need to post that video again because I accidentally reposted the wrong video. So I'll make sure to do that after this reading. Um, let's see. Yeah. So then I'll do this. I'll do a little workout. I'll do a bi uh, Bible AV. Um, and then I want to start a second series, like an, or not a second series, but an actual series, um, on my, voice recorder it's a sony voice recorder um see if i can see the product id the number i'm looking at is icd dash ux 570 it's about 80 dollars um but i bought a little uh micro sd card I think that's how I'm going to start storing things. I'm going to go find a, uh, cause, uh, I remember having a micro, micro USB, sorry, micro SD converter, uh, that converted to micro USB. Um, so it could plug into a computer and I think I might just buy those and store a lot of my, my stuff on those. Cause it takes up less space, but, I do like the idea of having um, uh, actual hard drives, so maybe I could use that as a backup for these, because these don't take up a lot, like the voice files, because there's no video involved. It doesn't take a lot of uh, data. I think I can store uh, 160 to 180 hours on the one that I have. So um, that's a lot of things to talk about. So that, that could be a cool thing to do. Um, and then I can have my own little library that takes up a just a little corner of a shelf or something. But um, but I want to I think I want to start an actual series on that that sticks to one thing at a time, and I'll stick to it while I'm out. Um, I could do that, but I can also subdivide it. Let me see if I have the folders in here. Um, so. Power on. Okay, if I hit options, recording folder, SD card. Yeah, so what I have here, I what I did was I have I have podcast. So maybe that'll just be like book readings for now. Um, or it would just be uh, maybe like practice sessions when I do things. So when I practice learning languages, when I practice handwriting, when I do things like that. And I just want to just like talk as I do it. Um, I can I can use this for that, or 
Um, my podcast could actually be book reports. So the other folders I have on here are the websites that I was looking at yesterday um, or the other day, archive.org, LibriVox, OpenStax, and Project Gutenberg. Um, and so what I could do is do the full reading on there. So just do like the transcription, uh, voice transcription of what I'm reading on, on my computer to this. And then um, also I could spend some time listening to that and writing some notes and then coming up with like a summary and then the list of summaries for the different books. Cause that's basically what a journal or uh, journal is like an academic journal. It's going to have a bunch of basically reports from people who did these experiments. So I think that would actually be a really good idea. And that'll showcase basically what I learned in college. Um, one of the good things that I learned out there. So that would actually be the open stacks might just might not just be open stacks. It might be open stacks plus um, uh, other textbooks. Maybe I think that would be pretty smart. Let me just go here. Let me see. Uh, recording information. Yeah. Okay. I, I was totally under doing that. 369 hours, 13 minutes, 55 seconds. That's how much storage capacity this one uh, micro SD card has. So 369 hours. That's like several months of what I've uploaded already to uh, YouTube. So like this will be like long term and I won't release any of it until it's all completed uh, with whatever I choose. So what I need to do is I'll need to do a uh, sort of reading schedule. And then every day while I'm out doing Instacart, I can just read and focus on that. Focus on those two things. That'll be like the dualistic thing I'm trying to get into that dualistic habit where I do this or that during this time. Um, and only this or that. I'm tired of watching YouTube all day, so I don't get anything out of it anymore except for the same simple, ridiculous pleasure that it, that it gave me um, that gives me no benefit. So, mm. so I'll talk more about that later. Moving on, let's get back into the great bo greatest books, uh, or sorry, the great books of Western history. I keep calling it the greatest books, but the great books of Western history. Chapter five, experimental, or sorry, volume one, chapter five, experimental science. The great conversation began. Okay, there we go. The great conversation began before the beginnings of experimental science, but the birth of the conversation and the birth of science were simultaneous. The earliest of the pre-Socratics were investigating and seeking to understand natural phenomena among them were men who used mathematical notions for this purpose. Even experimentation is not new. It has been going on for hundreds of years, but faith in the experiment as an exclusive method is a modern manifestation. The experimental method has won such clear and convincing victories that it is now regarded in some quarters, not only as the sole method of building up scientific knowledge, but also as the sole method of obtaining knowledge of any kind. Thus we are often told that any question that is not answerable by the empirical methods of science is not really answerable at all, or at least not by significant and verifiable statements. Exceptions may be made with regards to the kinds of questions mathematicians or logicians answer by their methods, but all other questions must be submitted to the methods of experimental research or empirical inquiry. If they are not answerable by these methods, they are the sort of questions that should never be, never have been asked in the first place. At best, they are questions we can answer only by guesswork or conjecture. At worst, they are meaningless or, as the saying goes, nonsensical questions. 
Genuinely significant problems and contrasts get their meaning in large part from the scientific operations of observation, experiment, and measurement by which they can be solved. And the solutions when discovered by these methods are better than the guesswork or opinion. They are supported by fact. They have been tested and are subject to further verification. They are told furthermore that the best answers we can obtain by the scientific method are never more than probable. We must free ourselves therefore from the illusion that outside of mathematics and logic, we can attain necessary and certain truth. Statements that are not mathematical or logical formulae may look as if they were necessarily or certainly true, but they, are, they, they only look like that. They cannot really be either necessary or certain. In addition, if they have not been subjected to empirical verification, they are far from being necessarily true, not even established as probable. Such statements can be accepted provisionally as working assumptions or hypotheses. If they are accepted at all, perhaps it is better unless circumstances compel us to take another course not to accept such statements at all. Consider, for example, statements about God's existence or the immortality of the soul. These are answers to questions that cannot be answered, one way or the other, by the experimental method. If that is the only method by which probable and verifiable knowledge is attainable, we are barred from having knowledge about God's existence or the immortality of the soul. If modern man, accepting the view that he can claim to know only what can be demonstrated by experiment or verified by empirical research, still wishes to believe in those things, he must acknowledge that he does so by religious faith or by the exercise of his will to believe, and he must be prepared to be regarded in certain quarters as hopelessly superstitious. It is sometimes admitted that many propositions that are affirmed by intelligent people such as that democracy is the best form of government or that world peace depends upon world government cannot be tested by the method of experimental science. But it is suggested that this is simply because the method is still not fully developed. When use of our method uh, matures, we shall find out how to employ it in answering every genuine question. Since many propositions in the great conversation have not been arrived at by experiment, or have not been submitted to empirical verification, we often hear that the conversation, though perhaps interesting to the antiquarian as setting forth the bizarre superstitions entertained by thinkers before the dawn of experimental science, can have no relevance for us now. When experimental science and its methods have at last revealed these superstitions for what they are, we are urged to abandon the reactionary notion that the earlier voices in the conversation are even now saying something worth listening to, and supplicated to place our trust in the experimental method as the only source of valid or verifiable answers to questions of every sort. One voice in the great conversation itself announces this modern point of view. In the closing paragraph of his Enquiry Concerning Human Understanding, David Hume writes, when we run over libraries persuaded of these principles, what havoc must we make? If we take in our hand any volume any volume, let us ask, does it contain any abstract reasoning concerning quantity or number? No. Does it contain any experimental reasoning concerning matter of fact and existence? No. Commit it then to the flames, for it can contain nothing but sophistry and illusion. The books that Hume and his followers, the positivists of our own day, would commit to burning, or, what is the same, to dismissal from serious consideration, do not reflect ignorance or reflect neglect of Hume's principles, those book written alter or after as well as before Hume argue the case against the kind of positivism that asserts that everything except mathematics and experimental science is sophistry and illusion. They state and defend propositions quite opposite to those of Hume. The great conversation, in short, contains both sides of the issue that in modern times is thought to have a most critical bearing on the significance of the great conversation itself. Only an unashamed dogmatist would dare to assert that the issue has finally been resolved now in favor of, of the view that, outside of logic and mathematics, the method of modern science is the only method to employ in seeking knowledge. <sighs> the dogmatist who made this assertion would have to be more than unashamed. He would have to be blind to him, or he would have to blind himself to the fact that his own assertion was not established by the experimental method, nor made as an indisputable conclusion of mathematical reasoning 
or the purely logical analysis. With regard to the issue, this issue <clears throat> about the scientific method, which has become central in our own day, the contrary claim is not made for the great conversation. It would be equally dogmatic to assert that the issue has been resolved in favor of the opposite point of view. What can be justly claimed, however, is that the great books ably present both sides of the issue and throw light on aspects of it uh, that are darkly as well as dogmatically treated in contemporary discussion. They raise the question for us of what is meant by science and the scientific method. If all that is meant is that a scientist is honest and careful and precise and that he weighs all the evidence with discrimination before he pronounces judgment, then we can agree that the scientific method is the only method of reaching and testing the truth in any field. But this conception of the scientific method is so broad as to include the methods used by competent historians, philosophers, and theologians since the beginning of time. And it is not helpful. Indeed, it is seriously misleading to name a method used in all fields after one of them. Sometimes the scientific method seems to mean that we must pay attention to the facts which carry with, with it the suggestion that those who do not believe that the method of experimental science is appropriate to every other field of inquiry do not pay attention to the facts and therefore are remote from reality. The great books show, on the contrary, that even those thinkers of the past who are now often looked upon as the most reactionary, the medieval theologians, insisted, as Aristotle had before them, the truth of any statement is its conformity to reality or fact, and that sense experience is required to discover the particular matters of, of, of fact that test the truth of general statements about the nature of things. In the knowledge of nature, Aristotle writes, the test of principles is the unimpeachable evidence in the senses as to each fact. He holds that lack of experience diminishes our power of taking a comprehensive view of the admitted facts. Hence, those who dwell in intimate association with nature and its phenomena grow more and more able to formulate as the foundation of their theories. Principles such as to admit of a wide and uh, coherent development, while those whom devotion to abstract discussions has rendered unobservant of the facts are too ready to dogmatize on the basis of a few observations. Theory should be credited, Aristotle insists, only if what they affirm agrees with the observed facts. Centuries later, an experimental physiologist such as William Harvey says neither more nor less when he declares that to test whether anything has been well or ill-advanced, to ascertain whether some falsehood does not lurk under a proposition, it is imperative on us to bring it to the proof of sense and to admit or reject it on the decision of sense. To proclaim the necessity of observing the facts and all the facts is not to say, however, that merely collecting facts will solve a problem of any kind. The facts are indispensable. They are not sufficient. <clears throat> to solve the problem, it is necessary to think. It is, even ne it is necessary to think even to decide what facts to collect. Even the experimental scientist cannot avoid being a liberal artist, and the best of them, as the great books show, are men of imagination and of theory, as well as patient observers who, of particular facts. Those who have contemned thinkers uh, who have insisted on the importance of ideas have often overlooked the equal insistence of these writers on obtaining the facts. <clears throat> these critics have themselves frequently misunderstood the scientific method and have confused it with the aimless accumulation of data. When the various meanings of science and the scientific method are distinguished and clarified, the issue remains whether the, the method associated with experimental science, as that has developed in modern times, is the only method of seeking the truth about what really exists or about what men in society should do. As already pointed out, both sides of this issue are taken and argued in the great conversation, but the great books do more than that. They afford us the best examples of man's efforts to seek the truth about uh, by uh, both about the nature of things and about human conduct by methods other than those of experimental science. And because these examples are presented in the context of equally striking examples of man's efforts to learn by experiment or the method of empirical science, the great books provide us with the best materials for judging whether the experimental method is or is not the only acceptable method of inquiry into all things. That judgment the reader of the great books must finally make for himself. When he makes it in the light of the best examples of the employment of different methods to solve the problems of different subject matters, he will not have begged the question 
as do those who, before reading the great books, judge them in terms of the dogma that there is only one method and that <clears throat> though there are obvious differences among subject matters, no knowledge about any subject matter can be achieved unless this one is applied. On one point, there seems to be no question the contemporary practices of scientific research, as well as the scientific efforts of uh, that the great books record, show beyond doubt that the method of the controlled experiment under artificial conditions is not the only method used by men who regard themselves and are regarded as scientists. It may represent the most perfect form of empirical inquiry, it may be the model on which all the less exact forms of science investigation are patterned, but as the work of astronomers, biologists, and social scientists reveals, experiments in the strict sense is not always possible. The method of the controlled experiment under artificial conditions is exclusively the method of that part of science, the subject matter of which permits it to be experimental. On the assumption that non-living matter always behaves in the same way under the same conditions, we are justified in concluding from experiment that we have discovered how certain non-living matter behaves under certain conditions. On the assumption that living matter, when very large numbers of units are taken into account, is likely to exhibit uniformities of behavior under ideological con or identical conditions, we are justified in concluding that if we know the conditions are identical, which is possible only in the laboratory, and if we know that the number of units under examination is large enough, then probably such uniformities of behavior as we detect will recur under identical conditions. The griefs and losses sustained by those social scientists who predict the outcome of horse races and presidential elections are sufficient to indicate the difficulties of their subject. No one would, pro would propose that the social scientists should not keep on trying. The more refined and complete our knowledge of society, the better off we shall be. But it would be helpful to the social scientists if they recognize that in understanding human beings who often cannot be subjected to experiment in the laboratory, like guinea pigs and atoms, the method of experimental science cannot, in the nature of things, produce results that compare with those which science achieves in dealing with matters more susceptible to experimentation. One eminent social scientist, Professor Robert Redfield, has suggested his colleagues consider their relation to humanity, to the humanities, as well as to the natural sciences. The imitation of the physical and biological sciences, he says, has proceeded to a point where the fullest development of social science is hampered. Identification with the natural sciences shelters the social scientist from a stimulation from philosophy and the arts and literature which social science needs. The stimulation which the social scientists can gain from the humanities can come from the arts and literature themselves and through an understanding of some of the problems which interest philosophers and the more imaginative students of the creative productions of mankind. According to Professor Redfield, the bond that links the social scientist and the humanist is their common subject matter. Humanity, he says, is the common subject matter of those who look at men as they are represented in the books or works of art, and of those who look at men as they appear in institutions and, and in directly visible action. It is the central and essential matter of interest to social scientists and humanists alike. Though they differ in their methods, they share a common effort, a common interest. And Redfield adds, it may be doubted if the results so far achieved by the social scientists are more communicative of the truth about human nature than are the results achieved by the more personal and imaginative methods of the artist. We should remember such sound advice when we are urged to abandon methods that have yielded important insights in favor of one that will doubtless be, help doubtless be helpful, but may not be able to tell us everything we need to know. It may be unwise to reject the sources of wisdom that have been traditionally found in history, philosophy, and the arts. These disciplines do not give us mathematical knowledge or knowledge acquired in the laboratory. But to say that for these reasons, what they give us is not knowledge in any sense is to dis uh, disregard the facts and to put the world of knowable things in a dogmatic straitjacket. The rise of experimental science has not made the great conversation irrelevant. Experimental science is a part of the conversation. As Etienne Gilson has remarked, our science is a part of humanism, our humanism, as the science of Pericles' time was a part of Greek humanism. Science is, is, it, is itself part of the great conversation. 
In the conversation, we find science raising issues about knowledge and reality. In the light of the conversation, we can reach a judgment about the question in dispute. How many valid methods of inquiry are there? Because of experimental science, we now know a very large number of things about the natural world, which our predecessors were ignorant. In this set of books, we can observe the birth of science, applaud the development of the experimental technique, and celebrate the triumphs it has won. But we can also note the limitations of the method and mourn the errors that its misapplication has caused. We can distinguish the outlines of those great persistent problems that the method of experimental natural science may never solve and find the clues to their solutions offered by other disciplines and other methods. Cool. Chapter six, education for all. We have seen that education through the liberal arts and great books is the best education for the best. We have seen that the democratic ideal requires the attempt to help everybody get this education. We have seen that none of the great changes, the rise of experimental science, specialization, and industrialization makes this attempt irrelevant. On the contrary, these changes make the effort to give everybody this education more necessary and urgent. We must now return to the most important question, which is, can everybody get this education? When an educational ideal is proposed, we are ident entitled to ask in what measure it can be achieved. If it cannot be achieved at all, those who propose it may properly be accused of irresponsibility or disingenuousness. Such accusations have in fact been leveled against those who propose the ideal of liberal education for all. Many sincere Democrats believe that those who propose this ideal must be anti-democratic. Some of these critics are carried away by an educational version of the doctrine of guilt by association. They say, the ideal that you propose was put forward by and for aristocrats. Aristocrats are not Democrats. Therefore, neither you nor your ideal is democratic. The answer to this criticism has already been given. Liberal education was aristocratic in the sense that it was the education and the, of those who enjoyed leisure and political power. If it was the right education for those who had leisure and political power, then it would be the right education for everybody today. It all should be well acquainted with and each uh, in his measure actively and continuously engaged in the great conversation that man has had about what it is and should be does not seem on the face of it an anti-democratic desire. It is only anti-democratic if, in the name of democracy, it is erecting an ideal for all that all cannot, in fact, achieve. But if this educational ideal is actually implicit in the democratic ideal, as it seems to be, then it should not be refused because of its association with the past in which the democratic ideal was not accepted. Many convinced believers in liberal education attack the ideal of liberal education for all on the ground that if we attempt to give liberal education to everybody, we shall fail to give it to anybody. They point to the example of the United States where liberal education has virtually disappeared and say that this catastrophe is the inevitable result of taking the dogma of equality of educational opportunity seriously. The two criticisms I have mentioned come to the same thing, that liberal education is too good for the people. The first group of critics and the second unite in saying, that only the few can acquire an education that was the best for the best. The difference between the two is in the estimate that they place on the importance of the loss of liberal education. The first group says, since everybody cannot acquire a liberal education, democracy cannot require that everybody should have it. The second group says that since everybody cannot acquire, acquire a liberal education, the attempt to give it to everybody will necessarily result in an inferior education for everybody. The remedy is to segregate the few who are capable from the many who are incapable to, and see, it, see to it that the few, at least, receive a liberal education. The rest can be relegated to vocational training or any kind of activity in school that happens to interest them. The more logical and determined members of this second group of critics will confess that they believe that the great mass of mankind is, and of right, ought to be condemned to a modern version of natural slavery. Hence, there is no wasting educational effort upon them. 
they should be given such training as will be necessary to enable them to survive, since all attempts to do more will be frustrated by the facts of life. Such attempts should not be made. Because the great bulk of mankind have never had the chance to get a liberal education, it cannot be proved that they can get it. Neither can it be proved that they cannot. The statement of the ideal, however, is the value in indicating the direction that education should take. For example, if it is admitted that the few can profit by liberal education, then we ought to make sure that they at least have the chance to get it. It is almost impossible for them to do so in the United States today. Many claims can be made for the American people, but nobody would think of claiming that uh, they can read, write, and figure. Still less would it be maintained that they understand the tradition of the West, the tradition in which they live. The products of American high schools are illiterate, and a degree from a famous college or university is no guarantee that the graduate is in any better case. But of the most remarkable features of American society is that the difference between the uneducated and the educated is so slight. It really is. The reason for this phenomenon, of course, is, of course, that so little education takes place in American educational institutions, but we still have to wrestle with the question of why this should be so. Is there so little education in the American educational system because that system is so democrat or is democratic? Are democracy and education incompatible? Do we have to say that if everybody is to go to school, the necessary consequence is that nobody will get educated? Since we do not know that everybody cannot get a liberal education, it would seem that if this is the ideal education, or education, we ought to try to help everybody get it. Those especially who believe in getting the facts and the experimental method should be the first to insist that until we have tried, we cannot be certain that we shall fail. The business of saying in advance of a serious effort that the people are not capable of achieving a good education is too strongly reminiscent of the opposite opposition to every extension of democracy. This opposition has always rested on the allegation that the people were incapable of exercising intelligently the power they demanded. <clears throat> always the historic statement has been verified. You cannot expect the slave to show the virtues of the free man unless you first set him free. When the slave has been set free, he has, in the passage, uh, passage of time, become indistinguishable from those who have always been free. There appears to be an innate human tendency to underrate the capacity of those who do not belong to our group. Those who do not share our background cannot have our ability. Foreigners, people who are in a different economic status, and the young seem invariably to be regarded as intelli intellectually backward and constitutionally so by natives, uh, people in our economic status and adults. In education, for example, whenever a proposal is made that looks toward increased intellectual effort on the part of students, professors will always say that the students cannot do the work. My observation leads me to think that what this usually means is that the professors cannot or will not do the work that the suggested change requires. When in spite of the opposition of professors, the change has always, the change has been introduced, the students, in my experience, have always responded nobly. We cannot argue that because those Irish peasant boys who became priests in the Middle Ages or those sons of American planters and businessmen who became the founding fathers of our country were expected as a matter of course to acquire their education through the liberal arts and great books. Every such person, every person uh, can be expected as a matter of course to acquire such an education today. We do not know the intelligent quotients of the medieval priests or of the founding fathers. They were probably high. But such evidence as we have in our time derived from the great the experience of two or three colleges that have made the great conversation the basis of their course of study and from the experience of that large number of groups of adults who for the past eight years have been discussing great books in every part of the United States suggests that the difficulties of extending this educational program to everybody may have been exaggerated. Great books are great teachers. They are showing us every day what ordinary people are capable of. These books came out of ignorant, inquiring humanity. Inquiring humanity. They are usually the first announcement. Oh my gosh, 
announcements of success in learning. Most of them were written for and addressed to ordinary people. If many great books seem unreadable and unintelligible to the most learned as well as, the, as to the dullest, it may be because we have not for a long time learned to read by reading them. Great books teach people not only how to read them, but also how to read all other books. Yep. Yeah, because you find that that's that's what I that's what I've been saying, is that there's relations between them. For example, here let's let's just do this little example because I, I I just thought of it. Um, when I go and I look at a building or I look at a piece of technology, whether it's bigger than me or smaller than me, because that's all buildings are. A, a building is a piece of technology. Um, even from a natural standpoint, like the human body is a technology. If you consider uh, the idea that uh, things grow over time. And that's basically what our process is. We grow over time. Even if, like, I, I think there's reports that say after 25, the brain stops developing, but it's like, you don't stop remembering things. You don't stop forming memories. You don't lose, like, the meaning of life because you stop, quote, developing, but you still develop. Anyway, um, what I was thinking, like, so if you have a church, what's the church for? Well, the church in its most general sense, can go to the idea that a building can be constructed for one specific purpose. For a church, it might be a holy purpose or for prayer, or it just depends on the church. The church might have its own message. But the idea is that any building is a church of some sort of idea. A house is a church for um, shelter, to get away from the, the the elements and to kind of quiet things from the outside to, to help eliminate some of the outside from entering into your personal space. Um, a grocery store is a church for um, essentially hoarding a certain amount of goods of a specific type uh, that can be used uh, by different people to do whatever they do with it. Usually it's for eating or for um like Fred Meyer is uh, more than just a grocery store. It's also a department store. So it, it contains like bikes and uh, gardening stuff. So it's, it's multi-purpose. But the idea is you take this stuff home and you can use it. Um, and it's, it's, oh gosh, sorry. The boxes, boxes next to me keep falling. <laughs> um, I, I have a lot of dialysis supplies. Oh, scared me. But, uh, so thinking that way, um, but the cool thing is people have started learning how our ancestors thought and how to, how to use your environment to their optimum purpose. So if you want to use something to its optimum purpose, it'll have multiple uses. So like with my voice recorder, I don't have to just record my voice. I can record other people's voices. Um, I can just keep it on and just record my surrounding environment but it records sound. And um, depending on how sensitive it is, um, it might record a lot of stuff. It might not record a lot of stuff, but it doesn't have a lot of purpose behind besides recording uh, sound. That's basically all it does. That's all it can do. Oh, it could also play sound. But I, if I take out my cell phone, now that, that one, that can record sound. It can record video. It can record... Uh, still images. Um, it can make communications between another, my cell phone and another cell phone. It can communicate um, between my cell phone and a computer or an application like Facebook or Twitter or any of those things. Uh, it has access to libraries. So if I want to, I can go on to one of those websites I talked about earlier, uh, like archive.org, and I can just read books on it. And so it has access to information, um, past and, uh, and present information. Uh, it has access to entertainment. It has access to statistics and mathematics. It can do mathematics and statistics. Like, it's multi-purpose. That's why the cell phone is so important. It can do a lot of things. It's, it's very diverse. Um, and then... But yeah, so that's 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 what I was thinking. So, 
Um, what's it called? Uh, I think I was going to go somewhere with that. Oh, yeah. But in, in, in all of those cases, the human element is present somewhere. Actually, it has to be present in multiple places. It has to be in the, uh, the, the theory behind it. So the technology has to first come from uh, well-established fact or ideas that already exist. And those have to be interpreted into a way of producing a physical object that is capable of, of doing those tasks. And so you have a bunch of people doing that. And then you have the people who are going to harvest the materials. So that way we have a way uh, or we have the stuff that can be used to make the thing that we want. And then that doesn't, that requires a different type of information. Um, and that requires the ability to know that, um, to know how to use tools and other technologies that were made by people who realized, you know, and so on and so forth. And so that's why I've always loved when people say they're self self-made, but it's like <laughs> no one's self-made because everyone's ideas come from someone else's ideas. Always, always because it took those other people to even just exist in order for you to exist. So in order for any of us to exist, it's just really interesting to think that. Um, but it took people. So for, so for a building though, cause that the building's the easy thing. And that seems to be what the, the, the primary thing for the world was then they built, they were more focused on the technologies of, uh, that, that, the bigger, uh, bigger than them technologies. So that's why you got all those like big churches and all that stuff, because there was, there was thought that went behind it. And there's, there's reasons why, like, but the, the churches have the ability to uh, carry sound in a way that's supposed to help um, essentially the body sort of, sort of transfer that, that medium into the body. So that way the media or the body starts to uh, exhibit that same momentum, that same signal. And that's like what a corporation is. A corporation is like one signal with one set of rules. And if you work for them, the goal is, is you're supposed to comply with all of those rules, even if you don't like them. And that's why the corporate world is so difficult because it doesn't take the human factor into it because a corporation is a human uh, by definition. Um, so, God, that's so interesting. I'm sorry. But yeah, it takes people to build those structures. It takes people to come up with the idea of building those structures. It takes people to enter those structures and utilize those structures in the way they were meant to be utilized. And I think that's kind of where modern society has kind of gone wrong is you kind of just build everything the same way. And it just, it doesn't, like it looks amazing. It's still great, but it's still a fraction of what could be done. There's so many cool things we could do that, I think we're underutilizing. Like we had ancestors that lived in caves. We had ancestors that built societies in the walls of canyons. <laughs> like that's amazing. Um, building the pyramids. That's amazing. Like just those huge structures is just, it's unreal because of how much work actually had to go into it. And because of what we do today is we build smaller technologies to do bigger things like almost any one of us, if we really put our minds to it, we could totally do these things on our own um, with the technology that exists today. There's there's no way that it hasn't been thought of yet. So um, I look forward to when that becomes more of a reality. But anywho, sorry, didn't mean to go through that. This is not to say that any other book, great book, is altogether free from difficulty. As Aristotle remarked, learning is accompanied by, accompanied by pain. There is a sense in which every great book is always over the head of the reader. He can never fully comprehend it. That is why the books in this set are infinitely rereadable. That's okay. That's it. That's it. It's like, it's like each of these books contains the bricks uh, for like, because it, it's all, it's all based on a division. It all comes from the one. Um, some people call it God. Some people call it the big bang. doesn't matter. 
whatever the origin of everything that exists around us, ex exists around us, uh, whatever that origin is, does not matter. What matters is that we can break it down. That's like one of the coolest things we can do. We can differentiate as Isaac Newton did uh, with his, when he, uh, when he helped, when he was one of the contributors to the invention of calculus, differentiation and integration, break it down into simpler pieces. And then that way it's not overwhelming when you're trying to absorb it all at once. And then once you have taken all the broken down pieces, you can then build back up from there problem is is if you're only focusing on one of the the segments of the of the broken or of the whole then you can only know or you can only understand from that specific perspective but because all ideas come from the same whole from that same initial perspective the human perspective we could definitely relate all of those different fragments with each other and so that's why in my opinion like we don't have to know, we don't have to be able to write down the whole truth to know the whole truth. And that's definitely uh, backwards in terms of uh, modern science, th uh, scientific and logical thinking. But like logic tells you that even falsities exist because we can prove, like I can prove something false just by, uh, or at least not, not prove it f that it exists truthfully, but that in truth, the concept of it exists because I can talk about it. If I can talk about something that doesn't exist, then that's almost like it exists. My, my internals don't know the difference uh, between fact and fiction, only what I feel when I'm exposed to it. So when I, when I, if I were to talk about a unicorn, I imagine a horse with a, uh, with a horn on its head in the center of its forehead. But because I can imagine something that looks like a unicorn, what a unicorn would be, that's like it existing. And so even though it doesn't exist, then not, not that we can prove scientifically or empirically, but like I can draw it, I can write stories about them. I can make all these realistic scenarios involving unicorns. Like I could take a documentary on horses and convincingly put on a horn using modern technology on these horses and say, and then re relabel it and call it a documentary on unicorns. Huh. And then anytime the word horse comes up, I can just have uh, it say unicorn instead, and then change the change the the gaps between or the the timing between the words, so that way it sounds like that it's how they're actually saying it. Oh man, that's crazy. But so that's why that's that's what changed my way of thinking. Um, part of it started when I was exposed to an idea on YouTube called quaternary mathematics. Um, it gave me, uh, it was very, very similar in a way. It was kind of similar to me to, uh, or kind of related, uh, imaginary numbers to me. Um, cause imaginary numbers remind, it makes me think of like a Cartesian, uh, approximation to a spherical coordinate set. Um, in a way, but it's limited to quadrants. So, but um, the idea of that mathematics was, uh, I, I, uh, it's almost like four dimensional mathematics. That, that's, that's what I got out of it. Cause right now, like, what we describe as three dimensional in the way I think is one dimensional because there's no such thing in our, in our perceptions as a snapshot in time, that time isn't a, like, is it isn't a force. Time is a consequence of relativity of, of the, the, I guess the differences between objects and how they move re relative to each other and all that stuff. Um, and that's also considering not just moving in like the I'm walking away or towards you or driving in one direction or flying an airplane or a helicopter or UFO going in all directions. It's, it's more, um, um, uh, 
Oh, shit. Hold on. I don't know. I don't remember what I was going with that. I'm sorry. Went too far with that one. Even even I confused myself. It hurt itself in its confusion. Now, good thing it's uh, not very effective. But um, but yeah, there's there's a there's a sort of humanity in it that. I think needs to be considered because yes, there are forces that are much better and stronger than us, but those forces don't have, at least as far as I'm aware, they don't have the ability to manipulate themselves in the degree that we do. Um, like for example, just something simple. Uh, I can choose to take a drink of water right now if I wanted to. And so I'm going to, That water didn't just come to my mouth by itself. I had to make the conscious effort to do it. Now, when I'm really thirsty and have dry mouth and stuff, I might instinctually grab for it, but I still consider that a choice because it's a choice based on survival. And that's always going to be the first choice people make when, they, when they're not really thinking about things, when they're, when they're working on something else. It's just an automatic reflex. And I think reflexes are super important. And I think... Honestly, reflexes are the most important thing to train. That's that's what I'm trying to design. I'm trying to design a uh, experiment uh, workout routine where I can build up my reflexes um, in addition to like my strength and my endurance. Because the reflexes, like in the moment, is different than long term. So. I don't know what that, that'll look like. Um, I don't know how far I can push myself with that yet just because of the kidney failure. Um, although I don't like to make excuses, I don't think the kidneys are actually in the way anymore. It's I think it's all mental now because uh, I just – there are things I know I don't need to do and, and there are things that I need to do that I put off because uh, I choose to, but it's also habit. It's a habit that I chose to develop over a long time. And there's a certain thrill to uh, to that kind of stuff. But yeah, I... I'm a weirdo. <laughs> I feel like I don't know anybody who thinks as in-depth in these things as I do. Although, I mean, reading all these books that I have, that I've started and stuff, it's really nice to know that there were people who are like thinking about these things and it's not just about sex with everybody and um, how to best identify in public and um, how to dress and how to wear my hair and should I have tattoos? Should I do all that stuff? So superficial. So uh, shallow is, is how I think of it. Um, I've always just, well, not always. For a long time, for the last 10, 15 years, it's been a little less than that. I still had the the joking personality and the the ability to see the good and the bad. Uh, but I really let it get me down for a long time. And it's just nice to know that there are so many people who have all these answers to questions that all of us have that... Um, we could solve so many of our own problems if we just took their words to heart and tried to understand each other. <clears throat> but anywho, sorry, did it again. But that's what I do. This is not to say that any great book is altogether free from difficulty. As Aristotle remarked, learning is accompanied by pain. There is a sense in which every great book is always over the head of the reader, he can never fully comprehend it. That is why the books in this set are infinitely rereadable. That is why these books are great teachers. They demand the attention of the reader and keep his intelligence on the stretch. As Whitehead has, as Whitehead has said, whenever a book is written of uh, real educational worth, 
you may be quite certain that some reviewer will say that it will be difficult to teach from it. Of course, it will be difficult to teach from it. If it were easy, the book ought to be burnt, but for it cannot be educational. And education is elsewhere. The broad promise, a primrose path, leads to a nasty place. But are we to say that because these books are more difficult than detective stories, pulp magazines, and textbooks, therefore, they are to remain the private property of scholars? Are we to hold that different rules obtain for books on the one hand and paintings, sculpture, and music on the other? We do not confine people to looking at poor pictures and listening to poor music on the grounds that they cannot understand good pictures and good music. We urge them to look at as many good pictures and hear as much good music as they can, convinced that this is the way in which they will come to understand and appreciate art and music. We would not recommend inferior substitutes because we would be sure that they would degrade the public taste rather than lead it to better things. If only the specialist is to be allowed access to these books on the grounds that it is impossible to understand them without scholarship, if the attempt to understand them without scholarship is to be condemned as an irremediable superficiality, then we shall be compelled to shut out the majority of mankind from some of the finest creations of the human mind. This is aristocracy with a vengeance. Sir Richard Livingstone said, no doubt a trained student will understand uh, As uh, Aeschylus, Aeschylus, Plato, Erasmus, and Pascal better than the man in the street, but that does not mean that the ordinary man cannot get a lot out of them. Am I not allowed to read Dante because he is full of contemporary illusions and my knowledge of his period is almost nil? Or Shakespeare, because if I had to do a paper on him it would, in the honor, Oxford Honor School of Ling English Literature, I should be lucky to get a fourth class? Am I not to look at a picture by Velasquez or Cezanne because I shall understand and appreciate them far less than any painter or art critic would? Are you going to postpone any acquaintance with these great things to a day when we are all sufficiently educated to understand them? A day that will never come? No, no. Sensible people read great books and look at great pictures, knowing very little of Plato and Cezanne or the influences which molded the thought or art of these men quite aware of their own ignorance, but in spite of it getting a lot out of what they read or see. Richard goes on to refer to the remarks of T.S. Eliot. In my own experience of the appreciation of poetry, I have always found that the less I knew about the poet and his work before I began to read it, the better. An elaborate preparation of historical and biographical knowledge has always been to me a barrier. It is better to be spurred to acquire scholarship because you enjoy the poetry then to suppose that you enjoy the poetry because you have acquired the scholarship. Even more important than the dogma of scholarship in keeping people from the books is the dogma of individual differences. This is one of the basic dogmas of American education. It runs like this. All men are different. Therefore, all men require a different education. Therefore, anybody who suggests that their education should be in any respect the same as ignore, has ignored the fact that all men are different Therefore, nobody should suggest that everybody should read some of the same books. Some people should read some books. Some should read others. This dogma has gained such a hold on the minds of American educators that you will now often hear a college president boast that his college has no curriculum. Each student has a course of studies framed or tailored, is the usual word, to meet his own individual needs and interests. We should not linger long in discussion the question of whether a student at the age of 18 should be permitted to determine the actual content of his education for himself. As we have a tendency to underrate the intelligence of the young, we have a tendency to overrate their experience and the significance of the expression of interests and needs on the part of those who are inexperienced. Educators ought to know better than their pupils what an education is. If educators do not, they have wasted their lives. The art of teaching consists in large part of interesting people and things that ought to, to, that ought to interest them, but do not. The task of educators is to discover what an education is and then to reinvent the methods of interesting their students in it. But I do not wish to beg the question. The question, in effect, is this. Is there any such thing as an education? 
The answer is that is uh, that is made by the devotees of the dogma of individual differences is no. There are as many different educations as there are different individuals. It is authoritarian to say that there is any education that is necessary or even suitable for every individual. So Bertrand Russell once said to me that the pupil in school should study wherever he liked. I asked whether this was not a crime against the pupil. Suppose a boy did not like Shakespeare. Should he be allowed to grow up without knowing Shakespeare? And if he did, would he not look back upon his teachers as cheats who defrauded him of the cultural heritage? Lord Russell replied that he would require a boy to read one play of Shakespeare. If he did not like it, he would not be compelled to read it anymore. I say that Shakespeare should be a part of the education of everybody. The point at which he is introduced into the course of study, the method of arousing interest in him, the manner in which he is related to the problems of the present may vary as you will. But Shakespeare should be there because of the loss of understanding, because of the impoverishment that results from his absence. The comprehension of the tradition in which we live and our ability to communicate with others who live in the same tradition and to interpret our tradition to those who do not live in it are drastically affected by the omission of Shakespeare from the intellectual and artistic experience of any of us. If any common program is impossible, if there is no such thing as an education that everybody ought to have, then we must admit that any com community is impossible. All men are different, but they are also the same. As we must all become specialists, so we must all become men. In view of the ample provision that is now made for the training of specialists, in view of the divisive and in disintegrative effects of specialism, and in the view of the urgent need for unity and community, it does not seem an exaggeration to say that the present crisis calls first of all for an education that shall emphasize those respects in which men are the same rather than those in which they are different. The West needs an education that draws out our common humanity rather than our individuality. Individual differences can be taken into account in the methods that are employed and in the later in the opportunities for specialization that may come later. In this connection, we might recall the dictum of Rousseau, it matters little to me whether my pupil is intended for the army, the church, or the law. Before his parents chose a calling for him, nature called him to be a man. When he leaves me, he will neither, sorry, I just thought of the worst thing ever. He will be neither a magistrate, a soldier, nor a priest. He will be a man. If there is an education that everybody should have, how is it to be worked out? Educators are dodging their responsibility if they do not make the attempt. And I must confess that I re uh, regard the popularity of the dogma of individual differences as a manifestation of a desire on the part of educators to evade a painful but essential duty. The editors of this set believed that these books should be central in education. But if anybody can suggest a program that will better accomplish the object they will have in view, they will gladly embrace him and it. Okay. All right, I'm going to do a squats workout after I disconnect from the cycler real quick. And then I'm going to take a cold shower and get me started for my nightly study session. Oh, man. All right, squat workout. I'm going to do, since my legs are not quite up to the same level as my arms are, I'm going to do the same pyramid workout, uh, three levels, 
and then the uh, cool two cooldowns. But I'm gonna do squats, and the squats will be 10, 20, 30, 20, 10. Okay, here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'm gonna blow my nose right back. Time to do 20. Right, there's the 20. Oh, that 30 is going to be rough. I can already tell. Time for the 30. Oh man, that burns. Oh, there's 30. The fact that I can't even state the reps tells you how bad my legs are. My arms, a couple months ago, I could barely do 25 to 30 of those reps at a time. And I was able to do a 25, 50, 75, 50, 25. 
without very much effort. And I was able to state every number. So that's how I know I have a lot of work to do. Oh. So the goal at the end of all of this is I'll be able to do <clears throat> 500 reps of each um, of each movement. So the three that I did yesterday, those are the I call those the shoulder rotation series. Um, I'll have to find something to do for my elbows and my fingers. Um, so I still have those plus the knees and the hips, the ankles, the toes, the rotations, and then I have to do there's some linear uh, motions that I have as well that I'd like to do in addition. But I should be able to do 500 of each motion in one set and be able to do a pyramid. That's, that's like my ultimate dream right now for my physical capability. And I have been neglecting it, but... I start doing a workout in each of the videos or at least get myself up to that to work to where I do a workout every video then that will be much better for me so all right see the 20 oh, There's 20. All right, so 10. All right, there it is. Call that good for this video. Ah. <sighs> 